Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, we're excited to have this conversation with you. Uh, we're going to take just a few minutes to let the room populate. We'll get started at approximately uh, 1.03. Thank you. Hello all, just a reminder, thank you for joining us. We're gonna take just another minute here and let the room populate and we'll get started with our conversation in just a minute. Thank you. Hello, everyone. My name is Sonia Childress. I am the senior, senior fellow with the Perspective Fund, and I'm coming to you from occupied Tongva land known as Los Angeles. Um, and on behalf of the IDA, I'd like to welcome you to the third installment of Getting Real Now, hosted by IDA. And I, I first just want to wish everyone uh, positive energy during these challenging times, especially those of us experiencing the fires on the West Coast and the hurricanes in the South and Northeast. Um, I am really thrilled to introduce today's conversation between two great filmmakers and great minds, Louis Masai and Yvonne Michelle Shirley. Today's conversation will explore the legacy of place-based and participatory storytelling, which is, um, from my vantage point, the foundational storytelling we need to lean into as we navigate this reckoning across our field and carve a new path forward. Uh, for many filmmakers, for myself, this is a Sankofa moment. Um, and it, Sankofa is a call to reach back um, into practices that we've honed in our past, knowledge from our past, to bring those practices and learning into the present to craft a new future. Um, and participatory filmmaking, place-based filmmaking is really that foundational practice. Um, before I introduce our guests, I want to remind participants that while Luis, Luis and Yvonne are in conversation, you can submit questions through the Q&A function on your screen, and my IDA colleagues Leanne Scriminger and Nikki Bardouage will moderate those. Um, it's important to know during the Q&A portion, um, if we do pick up your question, uh, we will unmute you and make your camera live so that you can actually ask your question in person. So please do know that. We're excited to see your faces as part of the conversation after Louis and Yvonne are in conversation. Um, lastly, I wanna thank our sponsors for their support for this vital programming, LADCA, LACAC, HFPA, Participant Media, the Jonathan Logan Family Foundation, 
the NEA, and the Wincote Foundation. Thanks for your support. And now I'd like to introduce our guests. Louis Masai is a veteran documentary filmmaker and founder of Scribe Video Center. Through Scribe, he assists emerging filmmakers, helps them author their own stories, including the Precious Places Community History Project, Muslim Voices in Philadelphia, and The Great Migration, A City Transformed. Lewis's documentaries include The Bombing of Osage Avenue, W.B. Du Bois, A Biography in Four Voices, and How to Make a Flower. He is the project director and co-programmer of We Tell, 50 Years of Participatory Community Media. Welcome, Louis. Yvonne Michelle Shirley is a na narrative and documentary filmmaker. She's a graduate of NYU's Tisch School of the Arts and is inspired by filmmaking in the social realist tradition. Her short film, Flowers, won best short film in the HBO short film competition at the 2016 American Black Film Festival, yes. In 2019, she was named one of Doc NYC's 40 Under 40, and she is currently producing a feature length film on the artist Gil Scott Heron, directed by Orlando Bagwell, another veteran. Yvonne lives in the city of her birth, Newark, New Jersey, shout out Newark, where she is working with local storytellers to develop the New Archive, a creative archive centering imagery of and by Newark's black communities. She's also the proud member of the New Negress Film Society, shout out New Negress, a New York-based black women's film collective. Louis and Yvonne, such an honor, such a privilege. The floor is yours. Thank you so much. Wow, thank you. Thanks a lot, Sonia. Um, wow. So I, I always think that kind of um, um, names are very important. And so uh, Yvonne, uh, Yvonne Michelle. So, so who are the Shirleys? And I, I actually have known you since you were probably like 21 or 22 yeah, so probably, senior in college. Around 20, around 20, yeah. 20, excuse me, all right. So, um, and, and I knew you was Yvonne. So first, yeah. who are the Shirleys and when, when did you sort of feel comfortable with Yvonne Michelle? Well, I think, well, the Shirleys, firstly, um, for me, the Shirleys are a um, foundation of the Shirleys comes from the relationships of four brothers, uh, four brothers born in Pensacola, Florida, uh, from between the 1920s and 30s, um, Edwin, Donald, Hilton, and Maurice. And they were four brothers born to uh, a Jamaican immigrant Episcopal minister um, and uh, raised, raised by, their, by that, that father uh, because their mother died in childbirth. Um, for me, they are the foundation. They define, I guess, what it means to be a, Sh a Shirley, uh, my particular branch and experience of the Shirleys. Um, one, because they were uh, kind of fiercely, fiercely independent, a group of fiercely independent men um, who also were, um, were, you know, while very much concerned with um, not ever being subservient, uh, they were also very concerned with being of service to their communities. Um, and so they, their relationships to each other um, and how they brought uh, their families up and connected us throughout the years and the value systems that they um, imbued in all of us really have defined, I think, uh, just my outlook on what I'm supposed to do with myself and my time and, and how I'm supposed to be in relationship to, to the the communities that I that I come from so that's um the Shirley's for me and I think um my name you know it's interesting like because for me a lot of I don't know when you were in film school if people were experimenting experimenting with their names um when they were kind of also experimenting with their artistic voices um but I guess for me in, in including all of my names uh now it just has a lot to do with them um, because all of my names are family names. Um, and it has to do with, uh, with just me, you know, as I develop my artistic voice, um, wanting to always consider all the parts of me 
and so considering all of my names, um, Yvonne is, I'm named after my mother's sister, Yvonne, who's actually pictured on the wall behind me. I don't know if you can see, it's a portrait of her up there, um, the center. Um, Michelle, and Michelle is, I'm named after my, one of my uncles, my, one of my father's brothers, Michael Shirley. Um, so that's just wanting to carry all of them wherever I go now. So that's the name, yeah, yeah. Great, great, thanks. So, um, but yeah, so I, uh, you know, I've told you that I had been, was, you know, first of all, I'm honored to be a part of this conversation with you, um, just because of, I, you're largely responsible for my pursuing fit film in the first place, just because your class at Penn, those many years ago, was my first, my introduction to filmmaking as a craft. Um, and so I've always, uh, well, in recent times, just considering all that's going on, really wanted to speak with you about um, your origin story, your um, entree into this field and, and kind of what, how you define your practice and, and how it's evolved over the years. Okay, wow. Um, <laughs> I, I think in, in, the, in, in the beginning, I, I was interested in film as, as, as a language, as a, as a mode of, of, of communicating ideas and, um, and I actually thought that there were there were advantages to what I'll call time-based, you know, moving images as as a language in terms of sharing ideas. Um, not that I I, I I I wasn't ever that interested in um, uh, in film as uh, as a consumable, as uh, you know, as as a commodity. Um, although I, I, I love seeing film and I love and I and I and I love purchasing film, but I really saw it as uh, a way of sharing ideas and and I, and really stories actually actually are secondary to the, to the sharing of ideas. I think now um, my my interest in, um, in 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 film is still very much about the sharing of ideas, but I actually see it in a in a, in an even more pragmatic way that um, that communities and people and sort of like down press communities can 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 use this medium as a as as a tool really in in struggles for self sufficiency struggling over very specific issues. So I, but it, but it's 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 an artistic tool and it's a tool that, that you know that has uh, where, where beauty works in 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 making it an effective tool. So um, yeah, I guess really the the, the potential of of a um, film as this um, yeah as as this mode of, of of expression, and so so in in September twenty twenty you know what 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 is your practice of media now what 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 yeah what is how do you look at media creation? Yeah, oh, I'm so glad you said so glad you said about the sharing of ideas. I think that's. Um, largely where I am with it as well. Um, I think uh, for me, the stories that I have pursued and, and well, firstly, um, I guess my, my attraction to film in the first place was very much tied to my um, interest in sociology, first and foremost, and how systems um, of oppression impact uh, individuals and individuals as their on a, as we all are on a journey to that journey to self actualize and um, you know I think just given communities I was brought into the families I was born into um, and their experiences it's the, always a very large part of any narrative of any um, any any in anybody's narrative I, I don't think I could talk to an elder my parents were raised in the segregated south where um, you know, their stories weren't very much tied to systemic oppression and their navigation of that in a journey to self-actualize. And so that's really, um, I think that's the center of my practice still. Um, well, still, it's, I think it's evolving, but it's, it's, a, it's remained a center even, I think when I first got, got out of film school and 
was really unsure kind of what what to do exactly but just um was pretty select tried to be pretty selective about where i placed where i, I spent my time um they were always stories about of black resistance which are you know sort of stories of black creativity and um about this this a, a certain type of coming of age story that has to do with like a coming of consciousness around this society and how to how to um you know become um within it mm -hmm. so I, I i still feel like that's probably just the the driving force i think i would I, I and i enjoy that in documentary and narrative forms and and now even more so um in looking at filmmakers um you know veteran filmmakers as well as contemporary filmmakers that, that i'm really drawn to are are playing with hybrid and documentary um, hybrid narrative and documentary forms of of that uh so I don't, know, I don't know if i answered the question if that's a definition but <laughs> that's a description great yeah um yeah so i was wondering maybe we could talk a little bit about your influences because i do think you know as sonia was saying um you know, and as you were saying that it is, as we're reckoning with so many things right now, um, having a community centered uh, uh, filmmaking, you know, is is just central. It's, I mean, just thinking about what we, we're all thinking about, what, what, what do we do? Like, you know, I'm just thinking about like, what, what can I do? What am I, am I doing the right thing? What can I, how can I contribute to this moment? Um, it does seem that community centered cinema is, re can really be such a powerful tool um, for where we are. And I'm curious, um, you know, and again, acknowledging that this is, uh, this is a form of cinema that has existed for, for quite mm -hmm. some time. So I'm wondering when you, as you were forming your ideas about how you wanted to use cinema, what were your, uh, some of your early influences? It's interesting, you're, you're, you're talking about film school. I, I, I know when I was um, uh, learning about film and really first being exposed to documentary, I think some of the biggest arguments really was were, were around kind of the the power differential in uh, documentary filmmaker, where you know the camera man. I mean, and I'm, and I'm consciously using that gender term. You know, the, the you know the filmmaker had power over subject, and the subject, particularly when the subject was the subject of color, African American women, or what. You know, th there is this huge power differential that, that, that was there, and that really was this tension and really a resistance in some ways to what I saw as a documentary practice. And then when I began to see, um, uh, and, I, I did, and I didn't have the word for it, but when you, when, when you, when you see more participatory uh, forms of, of, um, of, of, of cinema where the subject has authorship, or where you know the, the 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 filmmaker is part of the subject community. I mean, seeing. Um, I mean, I think the earliest example um, I think of, uh, and and it really wasn't a, a fully edited film. Was a film by Zora Neale Hurston yes. uh, in, in in the late 1920s. And there's truth in that. Uh, so I mean, like when I when I think of like the, the truth in Zora Neale Hurston's um, work. I see that same truth reflected in Julie Dash's Daughters of the Dust. I see that truth carrying forward to Beyonce and Khalil Joseph's uh, uh, Lemonade. You know, that, 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 that there's something real and true that sort of crosses time. And although I have a huge amount of respect for someone like Flaherty, but there's there's a, there's there's no truth there. You know, I mean, it, there is truth there, but it's it's very different. It it is that it's it's a power differential that makes me that makes me suspicious of of, of what's being said. Mm -hmm. So um, you know, seeing that, and then you know, talking about filmmakers that were making films, you know, uh, around that time. I mean, certainly seeing you know works coming out of Apple Shop in 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 Whitesburg, Kentucky, seeing. Mm -hmm. Uh, works that folks like you know Tony Buba, uh, extraordinary filmmaker in um, in Pittsburgh, was making, um, where people are are looking at big issues and their and their stories, but there but there but there there were films that were reflective of community, and then just becoming um, aware of this long tradition and sort of body of work of um, you know films that were were were, were again subjects. 
uh, are, are documenting their, their lives. And so I think in terms of, of, of my own practice and development at Scribe, it, it really was uh, really trying to find a way. And certainly, uh, you know, many people coming into Philadelphia uh, uh, at, at that time, I mean, you know, folks like uh, certainly Tony Cade Bambara had a really, really important role in, in, uh, in really th thinking about, you know, the, the power, power differentials in, in, in cinema. Uh, you know, folks like Carlton Jones, and there, there's, there's this wonderful woman who just made one film in, uh, that I, I've seen in, uh, from, from her, uh, her time in Central America, but she actually had a big impact on Scribe, a woman named Rachel Camel. And our first model, the first model of, of participatory media that I was involved with in terms of community media really uh, was came out of a, a proposal that Rachel wrote because, because she really had the language for, for that. So, um, yeah, I mean, I, I you know, it, it, it's, I, I feel that this place-based work uh, and, you know, community work uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm attaching myself or I've, I've attached myself to this long tradition. But, and, and, and you, I know, are, are, are someone who's also very, very much involved in, 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 in place-based place work. And so, I know you're, are, are you in Newark now or in Florida? I am. I'm back in Newark. I'm okay. back in Newark. So, I had to be in Newark for this conversation. <laughs> so, uh, what, yeah, so why Newark? What, 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 and because for place based work, the place is not, is not, you know, a uh, it's not, you know, it, it's a choice. It's not just something that just happens. It's not serendipitous. It, you, you, it, it may be serendipitous, but it's a, it's a choice. So, so why Newark for you? And, 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 and how has that been important in terms of your, your, your what you create and how you create? Right, right. Well, um, Newark for me, I was, um, I was born at Beth Israel Hospital here in Newark. And I grew up in a town right next door called Orange, Orange, New Jersey. Um, anybody that's familiar with the area knows we have all these little tiny towns. Um, and Newark is kind of like the, 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 hu the hub. Uh, and for me, it was a cultural hub. Um, growing up, I would, I, this is where I took all my instrument lessons, piano, violin, tap dance, um, can't, and this is where I, and also when I was, um, I wanted to be a doctor before I went to college. And I would, uh, they had programs for youth at the, the medical school here, UMDNJ. So I would spend a lot of time here. Um, and um, I think that I, uh, you know, I grew up, I went to predominantly white private schools in the area that were outside of my community. So it was like traveling from black cities to these spaces. And, um, you know, so often you're hearing just narratives of the places that, you know, well, I would hear narratives of, of these places that I called home and I felt like I knew very well that were so distant from what I was experiencing. And um, I think after spending some time in grad school and just trying to figure out at some point, just feeling very maladjusted in the ways that I was working and, and the places I was working. I'm just considering, okay, where do I go? And, and the idea of going, returning home, like why not um, go home? And then thinking further about what, um, you know, where my home is and about this home that I just, um, giving myself an opportunity to, to re-educate myself about this city um, and just, understanding and acknowledging the history, the amazing rich history of, um, first of all, um, migration, um, black migration here, um, but also um, just black creativity, black, like I said, black liberation um, in the form of, you know, Amiri Baraka, of course, and Amiri Amina, Amina Baraka, um, Newark, um, just jazz music in Newark, um, the nation of nation of um, <clears throat> nation of Islam in Newark, um, yeah. And so it just seemed like it was like wow, this is I don't know why it, t it took me so long, um, but I it just seemed like the proper place for me to be, and it was also like an interesting time um, where a lot of um, yeah, my comrades who had come out of NYU and were living in bed we were being pushed out to some extent, the rents were becoming ridiculous. And um, 
I had been reading a lot about revitali revitalization that going on in Newark. And I know um, at the time I was like checking in with friends that were here and um, there was a whole, there's the an ongoing debate like, oh, you know, is Newark going to be Brooklyn? Um, so it just seemed like a good time to come and to be, you know, someone who was of the community, familiar with the community and interested in, um, and interested in just anchoring and and being and, and seeing how as a as an artist I could I could be of service. It just seemed like a perfect perfect place to be at this time. Mm. Um, but you know I think it's it's like again like it, it's kind of was like a um, a re-education because it was kind of taking a moment to center myself and and um, appreciate where from whence I'd come uh, to some degree. So, um, you know, I'm, I'm wondering too, for you, Philadelphia, I met you first in Philadelphia. Um, and I don't think, well, I don't remember maybe speaking to you about like why, why Philadelphia was, why you wanted to remain your base. You, well, you, you're from there, right? No, I'm, and I'm, I'm actually in the house, this is embarrassing. I'm in the house I was born in right oh, now. Wow. Okay. Like, I feel like I've never left. No, but I, I have. But, uh, but you know, the, 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 actually the first board chair of Scribe is somebody I met in New York, was a, 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 this extraordinary empresario producer for, for, in public television, a man named Ellis Hayslip. Mm -hmm. And he told me the, the number one rule for an artist with choices, who wants to have choices, is to keep your rent low. So I... I, I, I that, that I have kind of absorbed that. Oh, so nice. no, I, I, I actually, you know, came back to Philadelphia and, and have stayed here really because I feel that, um, uh, that there's work needed here. Uh, you know, I, 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 you know, I, 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 I like the city. Uh, you notice I didn't say love the city. I, I like the city. Um, but uh, I really feel that there's, a, there's an enormous amount of work to be done here. Um, uh, when I was in, in, in graduate school, I was, um, I, w I was in Boston, and I was aware that there were like media art centers. There were places where filmmakers could come together and borrow equipment and, and, and work collaboratively. And in New York, certainly, you know, uh, at that time, there was a place called uh, Young Filmmakers, which was like in, on, on Rivington Street in the Lower East Side. And there was, uh, you, know, uh, you know, Newsreel, Third World Newsreel and DCTV. And, you know, all across the country, there, there, there was this infrastructure of media art centers. So Philadelphia certainly had a, a very long and rich uh, film history. In fact, um, Sigmund Lubin is a could uh, sort of a, a filmmaker from the 1890s, like lived like a block away from, from where I am now. And, and Michaud, I learned from Pearl Bowser, uh, would, would shoot in Philadelphia. Uh, but well, in, 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 the, in the 80s or whatever, there, there really was no uh, media art center. So that was one of the needs I felt, a, a pl this place where people could come together and, and work. And, and it felt like, um, um, yeah, it felt like important work. It felt like work that um, was part of community building, but also was work, it was joyous work to, to do. So I think that's uh, a lot of the reason, um, uh, you know, I've, I've been here. And also, I think, and, and I, I know you, you're, you're creating institutions in Newark now, you, you develop relationships and actually, you know, the people in your community then begin to count on you in some way. And sometimes you may start a project and think it's time limited, but no, the reality is you got to be in there for the long haul and the long haul may be a longer haul than you, than you ever imagined. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's, and that's uh, good to hear. Um, Cause I mean, that's, that's, that's uh, what it feels like. I, when I've, came back so I came back about three years ago and um you know I I connected firstly I reached out to a good filmmaker friend of mine Laurent Lee who's born and raised and um stay had stayed since he came uh, he went to Howard University came came back to Newark right after and and has been here since and um I, that was probably the best decision I made was just getting plugged in 
because what I found was there it, there was very there is very much an independent film scene in the city, and mm -hmm. um, you know I uh, there's just so many efforts, so many independent filmmakers. First of all, just that are making films by hook by crook, um, you know, renting out local theaters for two nights, buying billboards, local billboards. I mean, you know, just really inspiring um, indie methods that uh, I had not associated with even this place that I feel like I come from, but, you know, it was really um, encouraged and inspired by what's already going on. Um, and I think that just taking that time and, and um, you know, plugging in to, there's another uh, Rutgers recently, Rutgers Newark recently um, opened a community media center in a, um, a new facility that, um, you know, had an, has an evolving independent film program and, and uh, as a center for it, that type of access that, you know, people can come and edit and uh, they haven't gotten to the equipment part yet, which, which needs to, which we're working on. But, um, you know, it can shoot, there's a production studio and just even that just being a meeting place for all of us to come and learn about what each other's doing. Um, you know, has been so so vital, so vital of an infrastructure for for me and Lauren as we're trying to build out the new archive um, to, to yeah. serve. Definitely talk about the new archive. It's a, it's a, an extraordinary. It's a great name, but and but you tell me about some of the stories that that have attracted you to 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 to, to Newark and and to to the new archive. Well, I think you know. Firstly, it's um, I I, I mean I. I almost don't want to bring it up, but it's just part of its formation is that there's, when you come into, like coming back into this space, um, because it is this place that is um, experiencing all this revitalization and seeking to attract people to live here, there's a lot of talk about um, changing the narrative, changing the narrative, changing the narrative. And, um, and, and to some degree, that's a little bit, it's, it got to be annoying to me and Laurent, like it's, it's a kind of an annoying uh, phrase because um, the narrative that people are, um, that people talk about needing to be changed is, is the narrative that's not created by Newarkers to begin with. It's the outsider's narrative of this place. And so um, for us, it's like, well, we wouldn't say changing the narrative, but it's more so amplifying the narratives that are here and that have been here um and so how can we how can we do that um and our first you know we're both filmmakers so kind of our first our first thought was okay we'll collect stories from people and adapt them into short films and then find places here to screen them and um create just called curate conversations that are connected to whatever is happening here on a grassroots political social level um so that's the, that's the initial idea um but kind of the low hanging up and that low hanging fruit but that, of course it's, it takes money to <laughs> make films so you know kind of the, in the meantime in between time we decided to to just display the stories that we were collecting through the images and the personal archives of the people who were telling us the stories. And so um, we started uh, just an Instagram page and a Facebook page where we would just, we're just sharing um, people telling us stories and the stories range from, you know, significant social movements and, um, different uh, historians and activists that are very prominent here in the city, but then also to people that are just telling stories about holidays at their grandparents, um, telling stories about, um, you know, just self-made communities. Uh, there was one fascinating story by a, a guy, um, I think Brian, um, What's his name? I think uh, Brian Johnson, and he was a member of a house here in Newark. Um, a house. Uh, he said he was a, a, a gay youth who was put out by his parents and developed here in Newark. Um, a house, and and he and his other house members became his his um, family, and that they kind of they were definitely on the ball scene, but then they would also um, they were also social activists and would just would cater to needs in their in their communities. So if people were hungry, they would do food drives. Just, um, just different different stories like that that people have shared with us. Um, a lot of stories out of our Muslim communities. Um, great stories from the women women leaders in those communities talking about schools that they started and. 
um, just all of the just beautiful imagery that comes from comes from just such an array of material, um, of memories, dreams, uh, recollections. Uh, we have oh, also Newark has a great uh, archivist slash photographer um, slash educator, Bill May, who was a school administrator for years and. Um, and led Newark's music department and he also was a photographer, prolific photographer and documented um, so so much, so many of the schools and just beautiful imagery that's available through Newark Public Library right now. Um, and so we've talked with him just about his work and his his process of archiving. Um, so it's just a range, a range of um, just, just great stories, you know, and they don't all, um, you know, have to be it's not necessarily about romanticizing, but mm -hmm. it's about just, you know, humanizing, personalizing, um, just presenting the range of, of um, all that exists, all that exists in the city. Uh, so that's, um, that's what we're doing right now. And, and we probably will. So, I mean, as we are uh, cultivating our audience, um, you know, we are we do seek to align with institutions that are here. So we're, we're right now, we're at the end of the month, we're um, curating, we co-curated a series with the Newark Art Museum that's gonna be virtual in the next couple of weeks. Um, and then from there, we do want to be able to make films and just provide more um, exhibition spaces that people can come and, and, and we can share all that we collect. Wow. So that's pretty much it in a nutshell. No, but um, and, and, and archives now really in, in this moment, you know, where we are still locked in in, in, in a lot of ways. I mean, our archives and uh, uh, are are this this wealth, this treasure that we have, and and you know, part of part of what's been interesting about this time is figuring out how do you get, how do you share that archive? How do you make sure the archive is usable? You know? Yeah. Yeah, you know, I mean that's a huge. It's a huge um, issue, and I, uh, uh, yeah, it's it's. I mean, it's particularly in a, in a situation. I think what you said about the power dynamic is something that stays present in the work, and it's like who has created the archives that have been the most accessible mm -hmm. to people, and that's um, you know one reason why an important aspect of the new archive is to really. Um, collaborate with community members to mine their own their personal archives and um, you know help them with whatever digitizing whatever process they need to be able to access and to share because um, that's I mean it's I, I mean I feel archives it's especially when it comes to our communities and it's like such a it's a social justice issue and I feel like I mean I'm sure you've had these discussions before but um, especially coming off of a, I, I produce an all archival short film called Black 14. It was directed by Darius Clark Monroe. Um, but just trying to find the material um, and, and uh, you know, to tell a specific story um, is difficult. And it's in some ways, it feels like these institutions hold our histories hostage mm -hmm. because you can't, we can't get to them um, with, if we don't have a certain amount of money. Um, so, I mean, in so many ways, accessing archives, creating archives, even, I mean, there's so much work being done now of just creating archives, even if the physical archive doesn't exist, um, how do we reimagine, how do we re reimagine them, uh, you know, for us oh. all to consider, you know? So, um, I do, what, so what's, what, what's the work, I guess, what's going on at Scribe these days? What are, what are you all focused on? Wow. Um... I, a lot, lots of things. So one, one thing that we're kind of was like the rest of the world, where we was got of got kind of interrupted by the pandemic. Is uh, you know we, we had organized uh, uh, a, a traveling exhibition. You know, working with extraordinary uh, you know programmer of, of cinema uh, studies theorist uh, uh, Patricia Zimmerman, this traveling ex exhibition on participatory community media called We Tell, looking at 50 years of participatory community media. So we're trying to uh, bring that back and sort of maybe make it, not, not maybe, make it available online for online screenings. Uh, so we're having, going back to the, the filmmakers and the co-ops that have produced it. So this sort of, this is work from 1967 uh, which is, I think the first film is, uh, it was actually on film, it's from, from Newsreel, it's uh, Black Panther, and going all the way to 20, 
2018, so it's really, really 51 years, to, to, to a labor group in Chicago that was uh, documenting uh, sexual harassment of fast food workers. But in between, you know, just uh, uh, people involved in the, uh, in just variety of social political movements from all over the country, from, from New Orleans, from uh, uh, Arizona, from anyway, from 41 states in Puerto Rico. So we're, we're putting, we're, we're reorganizing uh, that and, and getting that on the road. Mm -hmm. And then we're also, you know, we, we began, we've been doing these community history projects um, for about, um, boy, about 15 years now, maybe 16 years now, uh, where we uh, have uh, two filmmakers working with a community group for about six or eight months to produce these short community histories. So, so far we've made about 108 of them. Mm. And so we began the batch of 2020 on March 14th. And so we thought, oh no, what's gonna happen? But so the groups have actually been working via Zoom and planning and now with sort of safe, you know, uh, you know, anti-COVID, uh, uh, you know, uh, protocols really uh, are now uh, producing those. Also working on um, uh, a, a, a larger piece that's trying to recontextualize um, Lenape, Lenape Hawking, which is really Philadelphia. This was Lenape land mm -hmm. uh, in terms of its relationship, in terms of the Black community that that migrated to Philadelphia, some brought enslaved, but largely migrated to Philadelphia and sort of defining a period between um, 1897 and 1965. So we're sort of just really starting that now. So, uh, and, and we, a lot of workshops, you know, we have about, uh, that we, many of them have, have drifted online and screening. So that, that, that's going on, but, but Scribing, you know, it has really been, um, about people, it's, it, it has not, it, you know, we're, we're, we're not necessarily technology rich, although I, you know, I, I'm, I'm glad, I'm proud of the technology that we have, but it's really been shaped and influenced by so many people over the years that are really now all, all, over, the, all over the world. I mean, we, you know, we, I remember when, um, you know, we, we, we talked about, you know, film and video as being community art forms, like uh, not just something for, you know, for Hollywood or for universities, but really for community art forms. And and I remember one 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 program director that we had at Scribe said, you know, we, we've got to figure out ways that people can see the work in community settings. A, a, a wonderful filmmaker named Dorothea Bremer. Mm -hmm. uh, and so we started an outdoor screening series, which we were able to do this summer, uh, socially distanced. Yeah. So, um, the, you know, the work, continues, you know, our, our archive has, has been really important to us. And, and uh, because we, we have interviewed, uh, community groups have interviewed a wide variety of folks. And, uh, um, you, know, you know, friends like Mona Jimenez, who, who, who was at NYU, uh, kind of helped us kind of honor and treasure our archive. And now, uh, you know, we, we are, we, we actually put them on uh, interviews sort of unedited for the most part. We're putting them on, on the radio. Uh, Working with a, a, a Penn student, a, a senior, a guy named Dallas Dallas uh, Taylor, who's really quite good, and, and Dan Papa, the scribe archivist. So, lots of people, and you know, we we, we keep trying to do the work. That's beautiful. Um, yeah. So I guess that brings me to my next question about um, just sustaining. I guess you know, it's as I, you know where I am in my in my filmmaking journey i you know, reflect back on um you know back to film school and kind of how um just the models that were um kind of taught and and can and feel now that i'm out of it just very narrow in terms of how you get a film made and how it gets support and um how you build a career that is that is can be sustained and i'm curious um you know with you having this this your this approach to filmmaking as you've had, like how, how has it been met by um, you know, the systems uh, of, of sustaining? And, and I, I'm definitely gonna turn this question, ask this question of you oh, as yeah. well. Yeah. Uh, you know, I, 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 I do wanna step back for a second and say, one, the work that you're doing now in Newark, the work that is going on in 
media art centers at, at Novak that's going on at visual communications in Los Angeles that's going on at, at, at a wide variety of places, you know, uh, you know, places like, like Cartemquin in, in, in Chicago. I mean, that, that have their roots in community media making is extraordinarily important. Mm -hmm. Some of the work, a lot of the work is not, again, it's not being made, it's not being made for the marketplace and it's not necessarily being made for people's careers. You know, it is being made because the, the, the filmmakers and the communities around them see this work as, as, as essential, as an essential service and, and, and a way that it's, it's the only way that we're going to kind of change the, the paradigm and, and really change the society is, is by creating a new foundation. And, and, and media is our reality. I mean, look at us. This is our reality. And so it becomes extraordinarily important that we, we do this work. The other thing is realizing that because it's not something that can be, that's a consumable and it's not meant to be a consumable, in some ways it's, um, it becomes problematic if one thinks, and I, lear I, I learned this, that if you think that this is going to be, is going to pay the bills, it's not. And so, yes, I also honor trying to make work that is going to be consumable to use my skills to try to, you know, whether it's making a film and being commissioned to, to make work and, and going through that struggle or teaching, which has been very, very important to me, uh, you know, really trying to figure out ways to sustain. But I also know that this particular community media work is, I, it, it's, 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 it's life and it's very, very important. And it, and it's the only way that I know that I can, I can see change happening uh, by by what 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 we do. So um, it I you know Scribe has been extraordinarily um, benefited from labor, people contributing their labor to its efforts. It's been very much benefit benefited by people in the philanthropic community that understand this work. Mm -hmm. uh, it means a lot to me. I mean, there's, there's you know, a, a local foundation here that's been, you know, a longtime supporter of Scribe, the, the William Penn Foundation. But it's also really important to me that the National Endowment for the Arts has supported this work. Because it, to me, taxpayer dollars should pay for this because it's for the society. Yes, that's, that's, that's my sense. But this, I don't think the sustainability is necessarily, uh, it's not a foregone con conclusion that this work is gonna pay for, pay for everyone's livelihood. I think one may often have to do other things. And personally, I'm okay with it. Yeah. Yeah. Yvonne, how, how, <laughs> how, how, how did, what's, your, what's your sustainability uh, uh, answer? Well, I mean, I guess it has to, I mean, similar, I mean, I guess it's, it's been, um, you know, doing multiple things at once, I guess, you know, and, and I, I feel, I'm at the place right now where that doesn't necessarily feel good all the time. Um, and uh, so it, it has, it has, um, you know, I have done freelance work uh, as a director um, and t teaching, I just taught my first uh, class at Rutgers Newark this uh, spring semester, which actually I, I am looking, hoping to do more of. It was um, a really wonderful experience. And I actually taught a class that mirrored very much the class that uh, you taught me uh, back at Penn, um, where we and we actually started with Zora Neale Hurston's film and went into your film and and some uh, filmmakers today that are doing uh, participa participatory uh, community centered work. Um, uh, so, you know, I think that having to um, just do multiple things at once has been how I've been able to sustain. Um, I do, you know, but of course I would like to spend more time, and I think this is where a lot of us are with my collaborators on in these initiatives with both the New Archive and the New Negress Film Collective, is um, we we really, uh, you know, feel committed to to building out um, and developing these spaces, and um, you know, want to 
be able to get to a point where we can spend, um, you know, spend our full time, devote full time to, to doing that. And I think, um, so it's a question for us, like, and also, you know, not only we, we're right now, we are benefiting um, from some philanthropic resources for sure. Um, but even that becomes like a question where we think about, okay, well, this is interesting. Um, where is this money coming from <laughs> ultimately? How do we reckon with that? And what does it look like um, for us to be community resourced? Um, and so I think, you know, we can see certain ways to sustain, um, but it also uh, sometimes, and especially in these times where, um, you know, I feel like it is a, a reckoning for, for a lot of us with institutions and their foundations and, um, you know, how they have their presence in, in documentary making and the tradition. Um, just how do we, how do we, how, how can we build, how can we be sustained by the community that we're serving? Mm -hmm. um, that's, that seems to be, um, yeah, that's heavy on our minds these days. This, this, this is an aside, but you know, I, I'd always been um, envious of Lerone Bennett, who was a, an historian yeah. um, uh, based in Chicago, but who would write these books and uh, and he would take an ad out in Ebony. I, I don't know if folks remember Ebony anyway. Oh, yes. take, an, yeah. take an ad out in Ebony. And um, I, you know, he was a, an historian that was sustained by direct marketing to the black community. And I'm thinking, yeah, that's, that, that's, that seems really good and really, and really healthy. Um, um, but but you know you you mentioned the the the, the new Negress Film Society and and uh, yeah could, could talk what that's that's a really really exciting kind of venture that that you're in could you could you talk a little bit more about that what what is that sure well um, the Negress Film Society was founded I believe in 2012 or 2013 um, mm -hmm. by a group of women filmmakers um, Nuatama Bodomo Jatavia Gary um, um, uh, Wendy uh, who's last name is escaping me right now, uh, Kumi, Kumi James, um, and another filmmaker. Uh, but I think the, the, the impetus was you had these black women filmmakers that wanted um, just a space where they could come, vent to each other, share creative ideas, um, and just really get, get affirmed, um, affirmed, get their voices affirmed, um, <clears throat> and, and then also share, share work together. Uh, create spaces to share work. And I think since that time, um, since that time, it's really been, been the principal function of it. But over time, we've developed into not just sharing our work, but also creating a platform to share the work of other Black women filmmakers. So right now, we have, um, actually right now, our, um, our second annual Black Women's Film Conference is happening virtually. Uh, and um, question sorry just a comment but I think the questions are coming soon but um yeah so our, our black women's film conference is going on right now virtually uh and I think but as we talk more to each other spend more time create create um and just further develop this the space we also want to be able to be to be for each other the um you know the 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 things that we felt were missing from the spaces that we where we were trying to make a living so right now we're also wanting to uh help each other especially you know for us it's particularly in the research and development phase phases that you know, we've been, where we've been the most traumatized uh where we're kind of sitting in front of people that uh, trying to communicate the very basic ideas uh, about our stories um stories that we want to tell um and and just Wanting to wanting to create a, a, a space where those um, formative ideas can be validated, can be nurtured, can be resourced, and where uh, a space can be created for you to take the time to further develop to further, further develop those ideas and, and launch them. Um, so that's basically right now what we're interested in creating for ourselves, and hopefully. Um, 
you know, we're definitely, as, as Sonia said, in a Sankofa moment where we're looking back to see what has existed um, that we can learn from. We just had a part of our conference, we just had a really great conversation with Zainabu Irene Davis um, just about her film. We showed her film Spirits of Rebellion, uh, which I would recommend to everybody. Um, Spirits of Rebellion, which, um, you know, tells the story of the, the LA Rebellion filmmakers and really is an education about their collective the collectivity going on at UCLA at that time and um, was incredibly inspirational. So um, yeah, so we're kind of looking back to see how we can how we can move forward and, and create a, a, a certain type of, of, of um, a model for ourselves that works for ourselves and, and are creating that can serve can serve as as a model for other people as well. Oh, great. Yeah. So uh, I wanted to, I mean, I think you've touched on it a bit, but, you know, given that we are reckoning with, um, with systems right now, I'm curious, um, is what you're feeling are, you know, what have been some of the systemic obstacles um, to, to the work that you've wanted to do? And, and, and what are you feeling the change, the changes need to be? Um, I know that's a probably a big question, but what are you feeling? Well, yeah, no, it, it, it's it's a big question, but it's also very very important. I mean, I, I I I'm aware that in terms of you know you know seeing media making as being uh, an essential part of a healthy society, you know, in 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 2020, that that you know the struggle has been ongoing. You know, whether it was a struggle for um, uh, public television, whether it was a struggle for public access, whether it was a struggle for independence, you know, independent cinema, uh, you know, the, this, you know, locating um, media as a, as a site of struggle is something that's really important. And there have been victories in that struggle. I think what, what, what we have to remember is after their victories, we cannot relinquish these infrastructures that have been created uh, when 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 the tide seems to be shifting politically and and you know you know these institutions are created we have to make sure that, that these institutions that we fought for uh, we still have access to and we still use and we still value uh, i'm thinking specifically of public television and uh, and that you know we cannot give up on that uh, and also, you know, at, at, you know look, looking at social media platforms, really beginning to, to make sure that our voices as we use Instagram or, you know, or, you know that, that we, that we're clear in, in our intention and that we don't get kind of co-opted and just become influencers, you know, that we, 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 we're using this for, uh, for a, a particular, um, you know, as part of a particular struggle. And, and I also think, you know, part of the work of, of media makers is being in conversation broadly with people in the community that are involved in social and political change and, and seeing that, you know, you know, we are working together. It's not that, you know, we are artists somehow separated, but that, we, that but what we're doing has to be in conversation and has to be, there has to be a lot of back and forth with, you know, folks, all folks that are really working for, for, for systemic change. Yeah. Um, and I know we're going to probably have to go to questions, but I just could just talk about uh, talk a little bit about what what your personal projects are right right now. What I mean, your your yeah. What 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 is on your plate, uh, Yvonne Michelle? My plate right now. Well, um, like I said, so the Ghost Scott Heron film that I'm producing uh, with Orlando Bagwell is is on my plate. I'm excited about that story um, because I think it, again it, it's a Sankofa moment for sure in that you know kind of the the time that we're traversing in that film and that's the story of Gil Scott and his work is mirroring so much of what we're experiencing right now um, so I'm also working on right now um, uh, in the very early stages of developing a, a documentary about my uncle um, Don Shirley who's a pianist uh, that was depicted in the film Green Book um, and so I'm very excited about that and I'm very excited about um, 
just the process again to film that's going to be produced by the um, New English Film Society and just um, kind of the room that they've allowed me to have in um, is taking my time with it and um, you know mining family histories and um, just allowing an opportunity uh, for my family to reclaim <laughs> reclaim this uh, this this family narrative is uh, very important to me and and um, uh, so, and I'm, I'm grateful um, for the support of, of my film collective to help me do so. So those are probably the two biggest things on my plate right now. Um, uh, what about, what about you? Uh, and, and I really want to see this Don Shirley film. It's very, <laughs> very important. All right. Um, yeah, I'm finishing a film on Tony K. Bambara, which is uh, yes, yes. I'm very excited by, and every time I get close to the footage, I'm, I'm, I'm lifted. It means so much to me, and and my, and two of my nephews are editing two short films that I've been working on, and uh, one is a film about Pearl Bowser, uh, which I love. I actually spoke to Pearl yesterday, and which also lifts my spirits. And uh, my other nephew is working on a film, is helping me edit a film about a, a wonderful photographer named Don Camp. So those are projects I'm I'm I'm, I'm in the midst of. So. Beautiful. Can't wait yeah. to see all of them. So I think now I, I'm forgetting. Hi, Sonia. All right. <laughs> I was so engrossed. I forgot I was supposed to be working. Okay. Hey, that was right. just such a beautiful, rich, nourishing conversation to sit in on. I feel like uh, you guys were sitting next to me at a cafe and I was kind of ear hustling on the best conversation. So thank you for letting us all in uh, to such a beautiful um, conversation and sharing of minds. Um, we have some questions, so we're gonna get into those. Are you guys ready? Yes. Sure. Okay, wonderful. Um, uh, again, if you, if you, uh, we're going to give folks some, uh, an opportunity to ask those questions live and on air. So spruce up your hair. Here we go. Kathy Stevelak. Um, if, if we can go to you first, Kathy, you have a question for Louis. I feel like Oprah. Kathy, Hi. are you there? <laughs> Hi, hi, just starting the video here. Oh, hi. Thank you very both, both very much for a wonderful conversation. Going back to the very beginning of your chat, Louis, you talked about story and you talked about uh, it being secondary to sharing ideas. Wonder if you could elaborate a little bit more on that. Thank you. Uh, very quickly, I mean, it, it, to me, narrative is um, a device. And for you know, sharing information, and it's important to me. And I, and I guess I learned this from working with um, uh, with Blackside and, and, and Henry Hampton that it's important that you, and, and, and narrative is a, is a wonderful way of sharing information and, and sharing history with people. But it's important not to be so preoccupied with narrative that you betray what you're trying to present. In the case of Eyes on the Prize, it was history. Because history is not narrative necessarily. So narrative, it's a device. So that's what I mean. So it's, it's the information that's important. The narrative is there, is a way that we relate to each other. And, and, and it's, it's, it's a cultural form that, 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 that we understand. Thank you, Louis. Um, next up, we have a question from A.K. Sandhu, um, a, a question for both Yvonne, Michelle, and Louis. Take it away. Hello. Um, thank you, everyone, uh, for this conversation. Good afternoon, good evening, depending on where you are. I wanted to just um, ask if you could speak to the importance of sort of cross-cultural work, especially, you know, when it's outlining the BIPOC, everybody <laughs> listed in that. So our work doesn't necessarily get categorized in racial categories, but and the, the importance of sort of building the, that solidarity within our communities. Um, I mean, sir, I, I, I can say that, uh, you know, the work that I've done, uh, I've been involved with at Scribe certainly has been um, 
cross-cultural and really working, you know, Philadelphia is a very, very diverse city, you know, you know large African-American, European-American, Asian-American, Latino, indigenous communities. And we've worked with all, but, but it's also important that uh, to honor that there are differences and that, uh, that uh, yeah, that not, not to say that African-Americans should be telling anybody else's story, but, but, but we, we, we acknowledge our, who we are, our, our, our identities in, 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 in storytelling. And also sharing work. I mean, that's how we learn from each other. Uh, yeah. I, I, I hope I'm answering your question. I'm... Yvonne, Michelle, do you want to get in there? Sure. Yeah. I mean, I think, um, you know, I, I feel in my experience of, of taking in stories that sometimes the more specific you can be, um, you know, the more it does, it does um, go across these lines. And so, I mean, for me, my work is focused on black communities and I always make a point to say black communities plural because there's so much, um, range within that uh, but again you know like i said the, the even in um but if you look back at just the histories that we touched on today there's evidence of a constant constant coalition building and and um collaboration and and and, and you know film i can't stop talking about this week uh, spirits of rebellion you'll learn more about that and and ucla coalitions um brown Black and brown communities, um, Asian communities that came together to sh to make work together and share their work together. Um, so yeah, so I think that history is there and and it should continue. And, and just a little two cents. So uh, actually, uh, Scribe uh, will be screening uh, uh, Spirits of Rebellion. We're doing a, a body of work presenting the works of uh, uh, Zainab Irene Davis that Marcel Marcellus Armstrong and Scribe is like putting that together now. So in early December. Uh, and it will be, it's available now with that everything that we're online, it will be available online. So I think it's going to be like the second week in, uh, uh, in December that we'll, we'll have the screening. What a treat. Thank you. And thank you, AK, for that question. Um, we have a, a question um, for both of you. One first from, this is from Christina King. Uh, Christina has a question for you, Yvonne Michelle. Um, Christina says, it sounds like you were very lucky to have Louis as a film teacher. We all are jealous. Um, was, was that kind of film education a useful part of your program? Or did you find that you had to unlearn a lot of things that had been presented and taught in a more Eurocentric way? Oh, that's a good question. Uh, well, firstly, let me make it clear. My, uh, cl my, the class that I had with Louis was, was my, my undergraduate class where, um, you know, an undergrad, I was just, it was in, it was in the African American studies department, Louis' class was within that, um, that major that I was pursuing. Um, it's, and it's actually that class in particular that I have gone back to, um, that has been part of my re-education process since graduate film school, which was very Eurocentric, um, very, um, you know, commercialized model of thinking about filmmaking and, and, and making films and, um, you know, creating a practice. So yeah, within, from film school, from, from the graduate film program, yes, there was a lot of unlearning, uh, but Louis' class was one of the, um, just one of the resources that I could actually revisit um, and, and re-educate myself and, and trying to reground myself in how I wanted to, how I wanted, how I wanted to do this. That, that, that's great. And you were lucky to have gotten that at such an early phase. So you didn't have to do a lot of unlearning. Um, the next question is, is from Christina to you, Louis. And, and the question is, what, uh, what do you think needs to change about film schools in general? Do you think some common practices are harmful? She says she's asking as a person who was taught a very Eurocentric curriculum um, and, and wants, to, wants to hear your thoughts. Yeah, the, 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 the film program that I, uh, I, I, that I, I think I, I, I most, uh, uh, you know, yeah, that, 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 I, that I really respect a lot is, is the film program. And although I, I, I didn't go there as a student, I, I, I knew, knew people who taught there, and I think I was on the advisory board at one point, uh, is, the, is the, the, the social documentary program at uh, UC Santa Cruz. And the reason why I like that program was, 
grounding film as connected to social movement, to sociology, to political change, and you know, you know, be Ruby Rich and Rene Tajima uh, Pe uh, Pena, you know, and, and and other people, you know, sort of kind of guided that program. And it, to me, teaching film in the abstract, um, which is sometimes what happens in film school, I don't know if that's the best way. I mean, I, I think that it, it's it's just one. It's a tool, film and. But now the other side is I really, uh, I, I went to a, a film program at, at, at MIT that no longer exists. Uh, and I still so value the teaching that was highly technologically based that I, I got from a guy named Benjamin Bergery, uh, who just made me very, really excited about uh, really thinking about the the really the technology behind how video worked. Of course, now that was analog te technology, and we're we're now in, in a completely different age. But it, but making me understand the components. So I, so on, on one side, I I I I, I, I honor the uh, very precise uh, understanding of you know of of the science of, of of the work, and I honor the teaching of craft. But I think that. Because, because we have to be thinking of film beyond Hollywood, beyond capitalism, basically. Um, I think it's important to, to, to sort of situate cinema in, in a broader context in the academy. So both um, the value and, and sort of the, the a focus on craft and technique and also a craft on orient, and, and an education on orientation. And political orientation and, and political development. social orientation, you know, it, it, right. yeah, human orientation. Yes. Right, right, right. Um, thank you for that. We have our last question. Um, this one's coming in from Assad Mohammed. Assad, um, can you can you raise your hand to 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 so we can see your your window here? Do you want to come on camera? Hi. This is, this is not a fraud. This is Charlyn. Yeah. Hi, Charlyn Griffith. Oh, Hi. Thanks for joining us. I know. Oh, leader. no worries. You're fine with the names there. Please, Charlyn. Absolutely. Ask a question. Welcome. Yeah, it's great to see everyone. Good day. Um, just having like I'm having listened and and listening through y'all's conversation. As a community member, as a person who is removed from the academy and that has done a lot of actually divesting from nonprofits because of the harm that nonprofits cause in communities oftentimes because of the allocation of resources, um, I think I'm wondering if you all have any words for folks that want to create story through film or want to capture story in film that don't, I, I know that we address um, limited budgets and that's a problem all around, but also there's like the problem of technical skill that it, I know for myself as, a, as an artist, there are visions that I have of telling my own story, our family story, community story, I'm an archivist as well, like telling stories that actually require way more technical skill than I have. And you all mentioned Beyonce and Khalil, and it's like they were able to do that because of the size of the budget, not because somehow Beyonce has a vision that girls in the ghetto that got three kids by different baby daddies don't have. We have those visions too. We have those dreams too. And so I'm wondering what is the, what's the language, what's the, what's the supportive language, the resourceful language that you all can gather for those of us that are not connected to funders in a particular way. And also never, 
were encouraged to go to art school to learn the technical. Thank you. Thanks. Do, uh, Yvonne, please interrupt me, but uh, just, just really briefly, I mean, uh, uh, so yes, we were talking about film schools, but my now, my nine to five, you know, Scribe Video Center has been around for 38 years and it is, you know, it's for people not in academia, you know, the media art centers were specifically created for people, for everyday people, people who don't have jobs, you know, one of our first, yeah, uh, and, and so I'm not saying that, uh, and I, where are you located, uh, uh, Sharon? Are you, in, are, are you in New York? I actually live between Philadelphia and California. And okay. Yeah. Well, I mean, come to Scribe. I mean, well, and, and now come online, you know. Uh, and uh, you know the the the, the works. Some some are free. Some are, are, are relatively low cost. You, know, ch you check it out. But the other idea, even if if you have an, a a project that has that that you're imagining requires huge amounts of technology, huge amounts of resources. If that's what you want to do, if if you're sure that it's the resources that you want to do, then maybe Scribe is not going to be the place. But if it's the idea. And the idea, and, and, and you're just thinking that the idea requires the technology, but if you can just really refine what the idea is, it may not necessarily be something out of reach. And, and, and you, you have to start, you know what I mean? You, if, if, to, to do the work, you have to start and then figure out what you, what you need. And the other side is that sometimes when people, if, if you do something and people can understand it, people will try to support you and try to you know, figure out some way for you to get to to share your idea and to get it done but do it that's the bottom line do it start start in 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 the smallest increment but but, but start and do something yeah. yeah yeah i mean i would just uh louis is the perfect person to answer that question and i mean i would say too uh, you know just to piggyback off of that use what you have use use what you have and i think even for me it is i think i think it was zainabu as well in our conversation who said something about sometimes the problem with education is that you get to feeling like you need certain things to make a vision happen and you don't. And I think that part of you know, my re-education process is, is looking, like I said, my arrival in Newark and seeing what people were doing with what they had to communicate an idea. And even going online, the things that we are doing, black people are doing on Instagram. I mean, with some of these social, it's, 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 cause I think, that, I mean, that's part of it too, is, um, you know, kind of not really, it's about how we also receive cinema. It's not just about what we're, how we're taught to make it, but also as an audience, how we're taught that it should be or should look or should feel. And I think that we can really dismantle all of that. Um, and you know, if you have an idea behind it, a feeling behind I me, mean, the stuff is all this is all about feeling anyway. I feel I mean, at the end of the day, it's about feeling, communicating feeling. Um, I mean, and and everything else, but really that connection. Um, and if, if that's there, you know, you, you don't need a, a, a huge budget to communicate that or to, to have that. And I think that you can, you can communicate that to people and transmit that to people with whatever resources at your disposal. Thank you both. And thank you, Charlene, for your question. Um, so that that bring that we're we're going to bring this to a close. And I just want to thank you both, Louis and Yvonne Michelle here. Your talk really underscored for me the importance of uh, lifting up the voices of folks like yours in this moment as the field is grappling with these questions of authorship and representation and sustainability. We should be following the lead of filmmakers whose practice embodies this ethos of accountability and rootedness in community. And your voices are really the voices I think that should be front and center in these conversations that we're having across the field. So I'm glad we all had a chance to hear from you too. Um, and, um, and I also just appreciate how generous you both were about sharing your family histories and how your family histories inform your creative practice and your political orientation. So thank you both for, for, for just sharing your, your wisdom and your heart with us today. We appreciate you all. Um, 
And thank you to my colleagues um, behind the scenes, Cassidy Diamond, Nikki Bardwaj, Leanne Scrimmager, Maggie Bowen, and the entire Getting Real programming team, the rock stars behind the scenes. Thank you all for your work. Um, thank you for Mara Bassani Santa Maria for her beautiful ASL interpretation. Uh, thank you to Tina Dillon for live captioning. Please, everyone, this is, th these conversations are meant to whet everyone's appetites for getting real, the conference at the end of this month. So if you're interested in joining us then, go to documentary.org for more information. The registration is open, it's free, it's a space for all of us in the nonfiction community. And we hope that we can continue these uh, really inspiring and thoughtful and forward thinking conversations. So please join us then. And Yvonne Michelle, Louis, stay safe. Thank you all. Great. Thanks so much.